turn on a number of factual claims. Right? There was Jesus, he died on the cross, there was Adam and Eve, they committed the original sin. Right? How do you feel about those particular factual claims? Which seem to be open to investigation. <coughs> but in the, in the case of existence of Adam and Eve, the evidence seems to be very much in it and against it. Right? First of all, uh, the existence of Adam and Eve, uh, that would be this the liberal liberalism that I uh, strongly oppose. Okay, so how do you get original sin? Yeah, how do you get original sin? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, we, before we go into the very much detail, this is Catholic conference, so uh, I, I will not think about this aspect. There is a lot of things in life about politics, decisions, whatever, where I think there is an overlap. So don't don't focus on, on whether uh, Jesus was living. Now of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Then, then I can give you a theologian's answer, answer. The original sin is a state of the world. It's not it's not one particular act in uh, in the history that would be dated. Uh, they even described that's uh, that, the that's state of the world. That is metaphorically described in the Holy Scripture as a story of Adam and Eve and the apple from the tree. Is this working okay? All uh, right, back to the to Stephen Jay Gould and the question of Noma. Um, Stephen Jay Gould is. Philosophically speaking, a classical modernist, his, his uh, approach is to categorize uh, separate phenomena separately. Uh, and Noma is based on the idea that uh, these truth claims um, are having absolute separation from each other. They rub up against each other, or some occasionally uh, a, a bishop will make claims about evolution, or a biologist will make claims about religion, so they bump up against each other, but they are fundamentally different areas. Kind of like mind and matter. Uh, the problem is, is that we know that uh, the mind doesn't exist without matter. Uh, we've gone past a lot of the core ideas, belief structures, arguments, evidences, or really beliefs uh, of modernism. Um, and uh, this is one aspect of Stephen Jay Gould's uh, philosophical approach that I think will need to fundamentally reject. There is one actual world, and there are various individuals and social groups that make truth claims within that actual world, and we can compare those truth claims against the actual world. Not perfectly, but well enough to, for example, argue there are no two separate categories of mind and matter. Uh, there, there is matter that is mind in the world, and the two are bound up together. So, uh, a noma I reject flat out. Now, of course, we have to be very particular about. You don't reject everything Stephen Jay Gould said. Um, his approach to biological spandrums and the Panglossian paradigm, I think he's brilliant and extremely interested in biology. Um, his article on Darwinian fundamentalism is partly where I get the definition of fundamentalism that I use in arguing uh, about religion. So there are many aspects of Stephen Jay Gould that I admire and respect, but Noma, absolutely fundamental. I would check. Yeah. Well, the way I understood uh, Stephen Jay Gould's thesis was that you see, there is um, there's a tendency, there's a tendency to make people who entertain the just notion of the world make them feel comfortable. I make them to understand that they have something important. Yes. So, so I think that for me, yeah, I think that is. You see, as an, as an intellectual, as an academic, you know, you want to make sense. I mean, why are people fighting over this science and religion and all that? Now, you conceptualize, you try to come up at the level of abstract and say, yeah, I think, I think you guys should not be fighting over this thing. You are using different paradigms to look at something. Okay. So, I think that that was an attempt. Okay. And then, um, it is also a problem. Okay, but let's assume you are using two different reasonable or rational, if I use a paradigm, to look at one particular thing, who is right, who is wrong, who is saying the truth. That was something I do. Are we going also to have two paradigms? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's get the issue 
question with the that we are concerned. Because here it's a lot, it's, it is not about to tell me here we have we have religion aside, we are talking about the case two friends or explanation. Who is giving us explanation of what is real? That's my concern. Even if there are ten, ten paradigms, I'm not interested in that. Which one comes closer? And that's our fault. And, and that's why I say sometimes we confuse people. <laughs> yeah. Because when you hear that now, somebody who uses witchcraft to say, okay, yeah, it's my own paradigm of explanation. Let me see what's wrong to sleep. You shouldn't. Go and question your paradigm. So that is it. My problem is that, yeah. It makes sense in looking at situations. But when it comes to fact, people want to know. First, first of all, how many people are here in this hall? How many spirits are here? Where are they sitting? Did they register for the Congress? How many paradigms are you used to explain the fact of this participation in this conference? So, yes, it makes sense. Let's intellectually like agree with But when it comes to day to day practice and life, we're explaining one thing, like you said. And we need to know which one it could. This is a question for Conrad. Um, I would very much like your um, comment about the evolution of religions and that it's about selection and the ones that survive and the ones that don't, and there are lots of Of course you do. Uh, of course you do. Of course I do. Of course I do. Aha, but I'm coming for the other day. No, it's, the question is um, concerning <coughs> intuitiveness, if that's a word. So you said that one of the factors that um, Causes, allows religions to succeed in this battle, in selecting battle, is that they're minimally counterintuitive. And yet, Buddhism has survived extremely well. And right at the heart of Buddhism, particularly in Zen, is the, the, the original teachings of the Buddha about self, um, often translated as no self, but really that we're deluded about self, that is not an agent inside that's persisting and can survive and so on and so on. It's all ephemeral coming and going and it's just um, impermanent like everything else. This is horribly counterintuitive. Yes, it, is. it involves counterintuitive about self, free will, consciousness and so on. So, is it just that it's got so much wrong place for survival or how does that fit with your comment yeah. about counterintuitiveness? Uh, yeah, it's something that I didn't make clear in my original presentation is that cognitive science of religion is primarily concerned about what could be best called folk religion. Right? So if you get if you go to a temple on a temple day and you pull out a random member of that religion and say, hi, I'd like to ask you some questions, the answers they give are the ones that cognitive science of religion is primarily interested in. Right? Now, Peter often said, you know, this is not what Christianity is about. But the thing is that, I'm sorry, you're talking about how you see Christianity, how you think it should be. And that's, that's an image of Christianity that I actually really like. I mean, that's, that sounds cool, that sounds great, you know. But it's not the image you want to get when you pull a normal person off, you know, out of mass on a summit. Right? And that's what common sense would do. If you pull a voice, out of a Buddhist temple, on a, you know, on a temple day, and you ask the questions, they will not tell you about the fact that there is no self. No, they'll tell you about personal information. I know. Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. They will give you a story which is uh, minimally counterintuitive. And there's lovely, lovely research done on this. This, this phenomenon is called theological incorrectness. Right? And there's lots of stuff done on this. Study, right? They uh, got a group of Christians and they read to them a story about how there was a fire in uh, Ireland and at the same time there was a uh, flood in Brazil. And there was a woman in the fire and she was praying to God and there was a man in the flood and he was praying to God to help him. And God helped the woman by, you know, helping her find out of the, uh, the, build, the, fire, the, the building on fire and helped the man by creating a wave which tossed him onto the side of the flooding river, right? Notice how I said that, it's at end and end, end, right? And then you get, you ask the Christians to repeat the story. And what they will typically do is they will say, God helped the woman, then 
he helped the man. Right? They automatically do not think of God as being omnipresent. They think of him as something like a superman. First of all, helps in Ireland, and then zooms over to, the, to Brazil and helps in Brazil. Right? Theological correctness. Because 
One example of oppressive social behavior is racism, bigotry. Right? You love your, your, your fellow men so long as you're, they're from your village. And everybody else, you hate those bastards. Right? That's pro-social pro behavior. And it's not moral. At least not the way that I see morality. Right? Uh, now, to get back to your question, I think the exact details of what behavior is going to be pro-social in a particular society are going to depend on how that society functions. But the basic picture is going to be pretty much the same. I mean, it's about cooperation, fundamentally. Right? Uh, will that change the society? Hell yes, of course it will. Right? It will allow a small-scale society to become a large-scale society because of the people who think that there is, a, that there is an omnipresent being that is judging them and capable of punishing them if they do the wrong thing. Yeah, that's how we change the society. Hell yes. Right? Uh, if you look at the book by Noam Zaga, Big Dogs, I think he shows a lot of interesting evidence for exactly that kind of thing happening. Okay. Uh, yeah, but my question is, do, do you see these overlapping areas as a problem for science too? Because uh, you, you brought up the, the, the topic of biblical archaeology. And biblical archaeology obviously has an impact on theology. It also has an impact on science because a lot of the people doing that science are very religious, and they are trying to. I mean, we see all this debate about about uh, where also politics comes in about the role of King David and did he exist and so forth. And I mean, this this has an influence on what is published as archaeology. Uh, well. Yeah, I studied with Israel Finkelstein, you, you, you meet me probably. Uh, well, biblical archaeology uh, used to be done by people uh, who were real believers in the 19th century, and by that time it wasn't a very good science. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's archaeology, and they don't even use the name biblical archaeology anymore, they use the archaeology of Silver Palestine. You used it. Yes, I use it because it's it's immediately understandable, and uh, well, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a normal scientific uh, scientific endeavor. Uh, of course, you have to uh, you have your biases. They can be religious. They can be political. Uh, if you are if you are doing uh, archaeology in Israel, then you uh, really hope to find uh, old Israeli settlements even if they are not, because if you do, you get money from the government for your research. Uh, not for Philistines, no, not for Canaanites, no, but for all Israelis, definitely. Uh, but those kind of biases are present, uh, present everywhere. Uh, but uh, this connection between the, the archaeology and, uh, and faith uh, is now relevant only in the pseudoscience. You also, you, uh, of course, you have uh, you, you have your pseudoscientific uh, archaeology people who are uh, finding uh, finding the pharaohs, pharaoh's army on the bottom of the Red Sea uh, or the Ark of Noah on Ararat uh, and so on. You have plenty of those, but uh, those are not, not archaeologists. <laughs> but they are funny. <laughs> If I can tell you on this, uh, I think you're right. Uh, archaeology may not be a good example of these days. But I think, uh, well, I'll tell you a story. A number of years ago, 10 years ago, I went to a meeting of the International Association for the Psychology of Religion. Right, so 2007. And uh, went on for a couple of days. And after a couple of days, I got this uncomfortable feeling that something wasn't quite right at this meeting. And I went through the whole handbook showing all of the talks, and there were like 400 talks. And she had a gigantic meeting. And I looked for talks that talked about two issues uh, religiously inspired violence, which seemed to be a fairly relevant topic after 2001, and also child abuse connected to religious institutions, which again seemed a fairly relevant topic at the time. Right? Uh, guess how many talks there were on uh, child abuse? Zero. Nothing. <laughs> on uh, religious violence? One talk. Out of 400. Right? Fundamentally, the whole field 
the, the only thing it did was to use questionnaire studies to look at people's image of God. And this, this is going to be somewhat caricature, but only somewhat caricature. It looked at uh, questionnaire studies to look at people's uh, image of God and correlate it with various personal characteristics, like you know something from the Big Five or something like that. And that's all they did. And this was called psychology of religion. And that's why we could do science and religion. Right. I think you also wanted to come in on this, yeah? Uh, a little bit in bringing up the idea of archaeology, it's kind of much, it has, I, 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 people call it archaeology. Um, but there's two things. The first is significantly more important, which is that um, uh, largely within the Western culture, the days in which paganism got adapted within the larger religion are generally over. Um, we have our Christmas trees, we have our Easter bunnies, you know, we don't actually worship Wogan and Esther. Um, uh, obviously, the process remains, and it is actually visible in many places, as we just heard earlier. Um, but today, the kind of popularization is with science, and is with making religion sciencey. So we have biblical archaeology, we have creation science, we have science that proves the existence of God supposedly. Um, uh, as I said in my presentation, as I'm very fond of saying, uh, I think it's actually a line original from that bill on TV, it's a lot of fun. Um, but if, if a couple thousand years from now somebody picks up New York City, uh, that is actually not evidence that Spider-Man existed. It just isn't. Um, and at, at the, the, the countless number of people who uh, identify as Christians and who devote themselves to attempting and badly to propose an evolutionary theory, that they're not actually proving a, a 6,000 year old Earth. They're not, they're not actually falsifying evolution. They're, they're, they're trying to make their religious institution appear sciencey because somewhere, perhaps it's not cognized, perhaps it's not part of their self-reflective awareness, but somewhere inside of them they understand that they live in a society that is grounded in science and technology, and if they want their fairy tales to be uh, respected, then they have to appear at least to be science. Um, and so a lot of biblical archaeology falls under that exact rubric. Um, but the other thing, if I can pick up a little bit uh, better, um, is when you said, I use the term biblical archaeology because it's readily understood. That's exactly the problem. Um, we're not a bunch of groups, and neither do I think that most human beings are, despite their behavior. Um, mm -hmm. People are capable uh, of learning. I mean, I'm an educator. <laughs> In fact, I couldn't do that if I didn't believe that people are capable of learning. Um, and they don't necessarily need uh, to be led like little children uh, to the truth. Um, they need to, they need their, I would argue they need their, the, the, the lies that are made by the grifters need to be publicly exposed. Mm -hmm. and the people who have the greatest responsibility for doing that are people who are the club. Please. Pastors. Oh, that's exactly what I said. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, but the, but the use of the term biblical archaeology and your excuse for that made me say, oh, no, just say archaeology. Archaeology says this. But that's the big research point. So I have a question on the connection. Okay, let me start. My name is Amadeo Shama. I'm from the German, from the German skeptics, uh, from close to Frankfurt. My question is very specifically on uh, the connection between miracles and superstition. And uh, the fact that, on the one hand, you could say that maybe believing in a statue of Mary isn't dangerous or um, doesn't endanger anybody's health. But we see that in many other parts of the world, also in the name of Christianity, uh, miracles are used to create superstitions and they really cause harm. People's lives are threatened. Uh, people lose their health, happiness, and so on. So I have two questions related to this. One is, what is the official Christianity, so the representatives, doing against this kind of misuse, as you put it, 
um, which really threatens people. And the second question is more, can you um, do this without, without rejecting the hypothesis that miracles happen? I think that's the, that's the basic problem. You cannot, if you say miracles can happen, how can you then say in Africa that's, uh, that's wrong, but this miracle is correct? This is, a, this is a very difficult question. And uh, I think we are about to uh, address a similar question also in the next block when we will be speaking about exorcism. Because uh, a possession and miracle has some, many, many, many things, uh, there are many similarities. Uh, first of all, uh, the general faith that miracles are possible doesn't preclude that any, uh, any actual claim of miracle uh, is right or wrong. Uh, any actual claim of miracle happening uh, has to be has to be examined and uh, uh, found right or wrong uh, by the by the church authorities in the first place. And uh, I will bring up uh, one particular uh, example uh, in uh, uh, since 19th century in the uh, in uh, many parts of uh, Catholic many in, in Catholic countries. There's been uh, several uh, Marian apparitions. Uh, that has been uh, always investigated by the church. Well, you know, in Lourdes, in uh, La Salette, uh, in, in different places. Uh, the church never confirms those. The church only states uh, that they uh, don't, uh, how to say, uh, uh, that there is nothing that contradicts faith. And uh, uh, in that. It doesn't just, yeah. How do you draw the line between this and what's happening in Africa? Well, I can do it in my, uh, I, I can do it in my conscience. That's, uh, that's, that's really a lot of my conscience. And uh, uh, what I see in Africa, <coughs> here my uh, our angry, angry friend uh, told us. Uh, I am horrified. I am horrified by those those incidents, and uh, I would I would fight fight against them uh, with all my might if I if I uh, would be able to. So I don't know. Uh, I I'm not in I am not in position to do uh, something about it, uh, except for saying that I find it really wrong. If I can just say something about Mary and Christians, that's because that's one of the things that interests me. Um, what's really interesting when you look at the attitude of the Catholic Church, though, because mostly Catholic phenomenon, um, is that there's a very practical attitude, right? The physical check is dogmatically kosher, right? But nothing gets said there which is dogmatically pro pro problematic, because that even be, you know, means that no, we can't, we can't accept that. Uh, secondly, what they do, and, and uh, this is recently with, with what you said. I think what they actually do is they, they don't take an official attitude while the miracles are happening. Once they finish, if they have not been shown to be false, then they accept them, which is a great attitude to take. And again, this is not conspiracy, this is what works. Right? They accept them once they've stopped and they have not shown to be either problematic or uh, false. So it's problematic, problematic or false. The question again is, doesn't that attitude also promote um, yes. superstitions yes. in parts of the world which can be from a threat to life? Yes. Yes. You <laughs> see, I'm struggling with all these you know, explanations because they keep moving from one magisterium to another one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm going back to this expression, you know, that they are not overlapping, but I think they have so much more load up in this response, as I must tell you. Um, first of all, there's something you can do to make sure that miracles or types of miracles maybe are causing the problem. Very simple. Tell people the truth. For me, very simple. Tell them the truth. And what is the truth? Good. Yes. Yes. No, 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 no. Yes. 
tell them the truth. Okay, now. We talked about you know, we talked about miracles and you guys are going to Africa. Why are you going to Africa? Who walked on water? Did Jesus walk on water? I don't know. <laughs> now apparently he doesn't know the truth. He doesn't tell the truth. We don't they don't go and tell people in Africa, I don't know. They tell you what is written in the Bible. Yes. Now, did Jesus resurrect you give somebody and the person resurrected? And in, 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 my, in, my, in my part of the world, you know, you see a spirit, you get scared. But this one, you see a spirit, you start walking in you. Somebody who died and eventually came back to life. If you start singing and start shouting hallelujah and all that. Did Jesus resurrect from the dead? <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> Did Jesus pass into that? These are basics. Immediately, you are not clear. Or you come out and you have a double. You have one answer for yourself and another answer for the problem. For the body, you are creating a problem. <coughs> that is it. And that is where you are telling me you can't help. You can't help. By death. You, you have told me you don't know. But I want to tell you, you won't say this to the public. If they read that verse of the Bible, you will say, This is the word of the Lord. And you will say, Thanks be to God. That's the confusion. Clear that confusion and those problems will come It's very popular these days to say that we live in a post-truth world, and that idea has been mangled and turned and mushed into all kinds of things. Um, there's still an actual world, uh, pragmatically speaking, um, uh, a thing exists if it has consequences. We can measure those consequences. We can discover something that we can call truth. That does not. We do not pretend that it is absolute. We do not pretend that it is finished. We do not pretend that it is unquestionable, unless we call ourselves religious. Uh, truth <coughs> is successful pointing at some phenomena that exists in the actual world. And we, we say, for example, that the Earth is not flat, it is round. How do we know it is round? We can use that model to travel from here to China to Chile and back here again successfully without getting lost. So it is true that the world is round because it, it, it is a coherent idea. It corresponds to reality and we can use it. Now, it's not finished. We can discover new things and we will change our truths. Um, so what is truth? Well. Take a stab at it, make a truth plan, and then test that truth plan, and then change your mind if it turns out your test fails. Don't just say, I don't know. Um, make a claim, make a stand, and then be willing to change your mind. Just have a in peace. Now, you might check maybe on Google Maps about uh, the Lagos based prophets, prof, uh, mm -hmm. the prophet GP Joshua, or something. You know, they, 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 they go by so many names. I don't know. So, over 83 people, I think 100 and something people came to the Miracle Center because 83, I think over 80 of them came from South Africa. But they wanted to be healed. He claims to have he, he had power to heal people, all sorts of healing. And the South Africans, over 80 of them, they left their country and came to Nigeria of all places <coughs> to get rid of all places. And they lodged them in a very in a, they lodged them they were staying in the building and uh, eventually made the building meant for uh, maybe fewer, fewer people, more people were there, the building collapsed. And at least 80 of them died. Why did they leave South Africa? In quest of them. So uh quest of them kills. Okay, I know that there are a lot of questions. I would like to divert to the issue and then you can divert it back. Uh, I have seen that Leo was in silence and I, I plan to make a question to him, but not. It's, okay, but still. Uh, but anyhow, uh, you mentioned Google. Google. Yes, I did research. I said that was okay. okay. I, I believe that Google Map because it's not good because if you check Google Map, check the South Pole and it's not global. So, uh,
so, uh, but anyhow, uh, I have a question to you, uh, basically, but of course you can react on that, and it's not about Christianity now, so it's, but about uh, religion or religious uh, thinking, that I have seen a troubling video on YouTube a year ago, or something like yeah, that, uh, about uh, the fallist movement, Science Must Fall, from South Africa. I don't know whether you have, you have seen that, it, it's an interesting concept it's, it's that you have to decolonize science, which means that, I mean, the lady in the, in the video, which was, I mean, which was about a meeting in, in Cape Town, in, uh, in Cape Town University, I guess, was about that, how do we know that, that uh, the fall, the animal falls, uh, like Newton said, it's just Newton who said that, and Newton was never lived in Africa, so how we, would we know that if, if, if gravity behaves the same in, in Africa, uh, actually it was there, and, uh, and okay, it's just an occasion, but, but it's really a movement. They, they tend to say that we, Africans, have to make our own science from scratch, because we believe about, which is about uh, uh, men uh, changing to animals and vice versa, and, and our science should be built based on that. What's your statement? But how, how widespread is that? Um, I don't want to give another lecture on this. Yes, so let me be as precise and right as I can. The crisis in South Africa is not just all about science. South Africa has a terrible history, racial discrimination. And since um, what I call the collapse, since the end of apartheid and all that, they haven't tried to achieve what they think is the understanding of racial equality. Yes. And I think that the crisis, to the best of I don't have much knowledge about it, but it's that this fee was poor. I think there was this issue of um, that the fees introduced the universities. Uh, maybe the poor black people could not afford the fees and not go to schools and things like that. So the settlements have to set us a, a crisis. So from there, it becomes everything must fall, including the uh, steps of, of uh, former colonialism and stuff, stuff like that. So and I know that this narrative came, came on board. Yeah, you see, racial discrimination can also trigger certain, maybe sometimes irrational reaction. Yes, because for them, it is still the image of a white, white scientist. That's what we're told. And I think that for them, it gives them this still reinforces that issue of uh, you know, inferiority or racial inferiority. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I think that, that, is, that is, it is within that context. And there are also people, yes, who are trying to say, yeah, you need to put Africanized science. Yeah. I really don't know what that means. Yes, I don't know what that means because we have to test it. Like, like we were saying that before, we have to test it and know what it means. But there is a narrative here that is very slippery, and I will fight, just as I'm fighting the Ellen Party and all the superstitious this thing. And uh, it was in one article written by one lecturer at the university, and he was saying that, yes, that the grandmother had some cures, that those cures are actually not recognized when medical science are formed. Okay. I don't know how we arrived at the fact that those claims were actually the cures. I will ask for that to be tested. Whether it was your grandmother or grandfather, the African or non-African, I'm not interested in the individual. I'm interested in the truth and the evidence for whatever claim. So there is this, there's, there's a danger here that they will now want to introduce certain narratives or certain claims into the umbrella of science in order to impose Africanizing. And I want to say it, science, facts, they have no color. Even when you give it a color, it will still be fault because it has to be questioned. It has to, it has to be reproduced, it, it, it has to be reproduced in other places. So it's not, it's not just all about the claim, it's also all about the outcome of the test. So it is, it is a, there's a very dangerous, I don't want to say dangerous, but I want to say that there's a very suspicious layer that superstitious narratives might be introduced on board now. African science, different from Western science, that notion now might be introduced on board now in, in, in the West Africa, um, African science. But I think that it is something that we will also have to say must fall. Yes, uh, I think uh, that's something uh, 
Jan already mentioned that uh, the pseudo-scientific terminology and approach is nowadays very popular in religious movements. Uh, it's not just a question of Africa, you also have this uh, Islamic science that is trying to prove that all geology and uh, biology and so on uh, uh, is according to the Holy Quran uh, and so on. But, well, that's, uh, that's just uh, something that is really popular because, because science gives an air of authority nowadays. So it's being used by the, uh, by the religious communities uh, in a way that isn't scientific. Uh, there is no African science, uh, there is no Islamic science, there is only one science. Um, obviously I agree with, with the general thought here, but what I'd like to say is that um, there is an element which is right in these kinds of ideas, which is not to Africanize science, because that's, that's nonsense, but to de-Europeanize science. To give you an example of what the hell I'm talking about, right? Um, not to do with uh, races, right, which of course we know all of them exist, but to do with uh, sexes or genders or whichever the term you prefer. Uh, until the 1970s, uh, People who study sexuality in animals and in humans were basically saying that uh, females are passive. They uh, either accept or do not accept the advances of the males. Right? Uh, the scientists who were saying this, yeah, they were male. And then you had a bunch of female primate uh, study scientists. scientists look at the actual uh, data and they went, no, hold on, these female primates, they're very much active, right? So that was necessary, right? In the, in the, in the sciences that are social in particular. To give another example, which is to do with races, right? Uh, the psychological studies I was talking about in my own talk and most other psychological studies are typically done on first-year psychology students in the United States. Right? What has famously been called weird people. <laughs> weird meaning Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Right? That's from Joe Henry paper. I love that paper, it's a really cool paper. Right? To have a proper psychology of humans, we have to have samples which are not that limited. The problem is, it's expensive, it's difficult. But if you want to have a human science instead of a European science or an American science, right? if you want to have a universal science, that's what we have to do. But that's got nothing to do with what these people are talking about in effect. Right? Unfortunately. And the last thing, right? Islamic science. You go back to the 10th century. Where were the scientists? Where were the scientifically advanced societies? Islam. In the Islamic countries. No, it wasn't, it wasn't Islamic. Definitely another two. I'm not saying that there was you know, enormous, massive growth of scientific knowledge, but if you compare that to what's happening at the same time in Europe, right, that was amazing. And what's also important is the role that those uh, places had in bringing ancient knowledge to Europe, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I... sorry, sorry. Just one second. Yeah, just a second. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you see, typical example is 
exploration of Mars. I was discussing with my colleagues. People want to go to Mars. I, I guess when you're aware, 2025, they want to send uh, human beings to Mars. The project has started. We are there. When they came to Mars and write the history of Mars now, they said, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> They will write the history and present the people who landed and said, Oh, the science about Mars is You get what I'm saying? You get it? And I'm going to take them to the classrooms. And I'm telling them, What are you doing? People are going to Mars now, they're colonizing. Look at what they're using for Mars, colonizing Mars. Who are they? Where are the South Africans? You are there saying science was fall. People are building another science again tomorrow. You are telling them that that science of Mars will fall. Do you realize the of mass? That is not what <laughs> <laughs> um, My name is Pauline Snaz. I'm from the German Skeptics, and I hope uh, that I can make clear what I want to say. I'm referring to German's uh, talk. Uh, I think I had a bit, uh, I was struggling to get what you really wanted to tell us, and I can really stop the point where I got lost, and it was when you uh, started your comparison of non scientific approaches to reality or beliefs um, to animal behavior. And I think that we all agree on the fact that science does good in the world and that it's a good method to, to yeah, produce knowledge, so to say, and so it's sensible to keep on doing that and communicating science is <coughs> one, but on the other hand there are other approaches that are quite good at generating knowledge. For example, when it's about your private life or, or the, the non-public areas of life. And I think by comparing this to animal behavior, it's, it might happen that you put it on in somehow temporal words and by that you, you make up a, a linear scale where on the one end you got animals and primitive and in this not yet notion and on the other hand you got humans and you attach this notion of absolute superiority and I'm not sure if that is a good thing to do, if it's good to think about that like this and to talk about that like this because there are humans who cannot think in scientific ways or do not want to think in scientific terms and to compare that to animals, has, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I, I, think I, I just fin finish my, my okay. one sentence okay. and, and, and then perhaps I misunderstood you. I just want so that's why I wanted to ask that. Um, I think this is a, a very risky thing to do in for for the people you compare to animals, for every non-human animal, and to the skeptic movement in general. So perhaps you could talk a bit about why you did that. Okay, but um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I just wanted to, in the interest of time, make that question. Uh, first of all, are you not an animal? I am. Uh, I am, yeah, okay, uh, then uh, I am actually not setting up a hierarchy, I'm setting up a heterarchy. Uh, uh, self reflection is a way of uh, deepening our entanglement within the world, um, it is our species specific knack. Uh, it is what we have evolved to do in symbiosis with a kind of um, uh, living um, world of symbols. The symbols also reproduce uh, with uh, variation plus selection, uh, as well as living things. Um, so uh, I apologize for the, I guess, incoherence of my presentation, um, because, no, that's not the point. The point is that all living things uh, must interpret the world around them. Uh, it, that interpretation must be channeled. Um, one of my favorite writers in a book I encourage, regularly encourage people to read, is uh, George Santillana's Skepticism and Animal Faith, and the argument that um, the, 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 the acting upon perception without an intermediate step of self-reflection, of questioning, is my perception wrong? that that is uh, a ground that we can call faith. Um, I, I act on this belief because I believe it, and I see it in the world because I believe it's in the world, and don't ask me to analyze it because I don't want to. Um, the fact that we celebrate such ignorance by calling it, by, by celebrating this faith, by, by standing by our principles, by refusing 
to re-examine the presumptions by which we understand the world. Um, when I when I say uh, that um, religious behavior is animal behavior, I'm including human beings in that. But human beings have also evolved along with our ability to abstract this process um, and instituted in social organizations and dogmas and books. We have also simultaneously and in synergistic conjunction at the same time, the two are bound up together, we have evolved an ability to examine our belief structures critically with logic, examining the mental map against the map to see how it works as a map, as well as uh, examining the map in comparison with the territory to see if the thing I think is true is true. So um, it's not a heterarchy. I mean, it's not a hierarchy. It's a heterarchy. And the great analogy is the last, well, the closing paragraphs of Origin of the Species, uh, where Darwin um, compares uh, life to a tangled bank. The more entangled a thing is in its actual circumstances, the more the, more the reality informs the thoughts, and the more the thoughts inform the actions in reality, the more successful, the more likely to be true, the more likely to be useful those ideas are. So, um, again, I apologize if I didn't make it very clear, but no, I'm not, I'm not trying to establish a hierarchy where human beings are above animals, I'm recognizing that we are animals. I hope you have to keep this into one sentence. Sometimes people tend to think of science as a kind of magic, but Scientists are simply using the normal human cognitive abilities, but within a context of a social institution which reinforces particular patterns of behavior and organizes them in such a way that at least these amazing results that we find out about aspects of the universe are so far from my from our normal everyday experience. Right? That's what I find fascinating. How science is both very much like normal everyday thinking, and yet so much unlike that, because of the social institution that organizes it. And it begins with a simple question. Uh, what if I'm wrong? All right, um, Scott Harrison, Australian. I'll make it quick and direct. Uh, Leo, what happened to Robert Goat? What was the consequences for the goat? Uh, <laughs> and actually, this is a compound question, but I actually then want to fire to Peter as far as like, how do you see the skeptics community could support religion in terms of helping prevent the misappropriation of your religion to prevent the consequences that are occurring to people who are, are buying into the superstitious <coughs> beliefs. Um, let me <laughs> let me just yeah, just but just the, the you know, let me also follow what you said. Let me take a start at what could have happened to the world ago. Okay? I'm sure the the head of the police station must know exactly what will really happen to the vote after a while. Because those are just the very precious when it comes to feeding, basic feeding and meals in Nigeria. So yes, that would be good. So the, police, the head of the police station, that very police station must have maybe at a point they said no, this must be a big good. <laughs> so you didn't press by No, they didn't press any, any case. No, no, no. That was it, it ended up there. And after that it ended up there because some segments of Nigerian uh, some segment of Nigerian population was embarrassed. Yeah, but um, you know that's this kind of uh, situation where you are not sure. That is the problem with religion is talking for us. They always make you feel that you, a good is not a real good. It could be a human being. But that human being could also not be a real human being. It could be a bird or a goat. So that is the problem. So, so some people are still thinking, no, not sure. <laughs> so, so that is the, that is the, so there are some men of the population that will think that way. But some will boldly say, yes, this is a goat. Kill it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, Oh, I just want to respond. Was that goat? From medieval Europe, we have uh, uh, we have cases of domestic animals being uh, uh, charged uh, uh, and uh, and burned at stake. Uh, so it was probably a lucky goat. 
Uh, I, just, I just want to make a, one closing remark. Uh, we live in, uh, in, in our uh, social, social context. Uh, I live in Western Europe, or Central Europe, in quite a liberal society. Uh, so I can live my religion uh, peacefully and I can uh, live it according to my uh, skeptical point of view. I would say to you, Leo, uh, if I would live in Africa and see what you have seen and uh, experience what you have experienced, I would probably be similarly based uh, by religion as you are. So, so, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if you lived in Africa, would you be an atheist skeptic? Maybe, I don't know, but maybe. <laughs> What do you say? <laughs> 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 <laughs>